Back in the video where we considered the macroscopic structure of muscle, we looked at how a whole muscle that you can see at the top here is really just bundles and bundles of muscle fascicles all wrapped up together. And then if we zoom in a little bit and look at each muscle fascicle, they are really just bundles and bundles of muscle fibers. And if we zoom into a muscle fiber, then they have a similar characteristic in that they are just bundles of myofibrils. So you've got this same structure repeating itself as you get smaller and smaller through the muscle. And that's the fundamental structure of all muscles within our body. But using this structure, nature has been able to create all of these different muscle shapes and types that we can see within our body. And these shapes really affect the way that the muscle can produce force. So some are, are fast, some muscles are slow, some muscles are strong, some muscles are not so strong. So in this lecture, we're going to look at these concepts of how the muscle arrangement, or as the video is called, fascicle arrangement, affects the way that the muscle can produce force and act and behave. So the first concept that we're going to look at is fascicles in series. Now this term uh, fascicles in series, the, the same properties can translate just like in our whole muscle here, how the same properties go down to the microscopic level. The, the properties work if we go at, from the fascicle level down to the sarcomere level. So I'm going to draw some sarcomeres because they're, they're easier to draw and hopefully it's, it's easier for you to, to pick up what the concept that I'm talking about here. So when we have fascicles or sarcomeres in series, we have them end to end, end to end. So if I were to draw some sarcomeres in series, let's draw four sarcomeres in series, we'd have the first actin filament there with myosin in the middle, and then the second sarcomere there. Oops, there's a close. And then we've got the third sarcomere there and then the fourth sarcomere there. So we've got one, two, three, four sarcomeres in series with one another. So what is the advantage of having these sarcomeres in series? Well, it gives the muscle length first of all, and that's important because we need muscles to have a certain amount of length um, in order for them to attach between the bones. But functionally and mechanically, there are some advantages as well. So each sarcomere here, if we were to look just at sarcomere number one, it has a fixed, what we would refer to as contraction, contraction uh, range and speed. Okay, so it can only shorten by so much. It can only shorten as far as the actin can be pulled together by the myosin. Similarly, it, the myosin can only use energy at a certain rate and it can only create that shortening at a certain speed. So one sarcomere by itself can only produce a certain amount of shortening at a certain speed. So it's fairly limited. But if you put sarcomeres in series, and then we have now, for example, two sarcomeres end to end, they both have a certain contraction range. So you are effectively doubling the length or doubling the amount that those two sarcomeres can shorten as one unit. And similarly, you're doubling the speed that they can contract at. They each have a finite speed. They can each contract. They it doubles the speed by having two of them end to end. And the same principles apply. If you have four sarcomeres end to end, you're quadrupling the contraction range and the speed that they as a unit can perform within. So sarcomeres in series end to end basically means that they can be fast and contract a long way. So they can contract far. And that's a good characteristic of, for example, on the right hand side here, sartorius, a big, long, strappy, thin muscle that starts all the way up at the hip and connects down in, through the inner thigh to the knee. And it can contract across a really long way and also at a fast rate. Now, the non-intuitive thing about 
uh, having sarcomeres or fascicles in series is that they don't influence force. So even though in this example here we've got four sarcomeres, four functioning muscle units, it has no, they're no more stronger than having one functioning sarcomere, one functioning unit. And the reason for that is that the sarcomeres in series are acting in a chain formation. And just like the old cliche, it's only a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. It's the same works for sarcomeres in series. So you can only really the transfer force across the sarcomere chain. But if one sarcomere is weaker than the others, then that whole chain is limited by that one particular sarcomere. So no influence on force. But if you are to put sarcomeres in parallel with one another, and parallel means that they are side by side, then you start to increase the amount of force that the sarcomeres can produce uh, together as a unit. So for example, if we have what's called the muscle tendon junction, so the part where the muscle fibers connect to a tendon and that tendon is obviously connecting to a bone and the force of the muscle is going to pull the bone in that direction. The more sarcomeres that you have coming off that muscle tendon junction that are side by side that are in parallel with one another, the stronger they will be. So in this case here, we've got four sarcomeres again. And those four sarcomeres are effectively working independently. They are four times stronger than one sarcomere working by themselves because they are each applying their own force on the muscle tendon junction and pulling the bone and the tendon in the direction that they're contracting in. The disadvantage of having fibers in parallel is that there is no effect on speed or range. So the sarcomeres in parallel can only contract as far as the actin will let them and they are limited by having just one uh, sarcomeres worth of contraction range and speed. So if you want a strong muscle like a big glute max or a quadriceps uh, muscle, then you want to look at getting these fibers in parallel. But if you want a fast muscle like the sartorius or the biceps, where you need to produce force across a big range and quickly, then you're looking at these uh, arrangements in series. Now the last little trick that nature has up its sleeve we're going to look at in the next video and that deals with this concept of penation. So you can see here we've got the deltoid is referred to as a multipenate muscle and the rectus femoris here is referred to as a bipenate muscle. And it's a neat little trick that nature has in arranging the fascicles and fibers within a muscle to help it function at a, um, at a higher force without compromising the muscle size. So I hope you enjoy the next lecture on muscle penation.